Hello, my name is Fiona Holden. I'm a clinical nurse practitioner. And I'm Claire Akers. Work at University College Hospital London. We see patients in clinic um, and at that point we will go through all of the various treatments available for them for their erectile dysfunction. We meet them at different stages along their erectile dysfunction pathway. Often uh, the patient will be seen first by the doctor and be investigated for their erectile dysfunction and then they'll get referred to us for their different treatments. So obviously there's a range of treatments that people are offered starting with tablets uh, PD-5 inhibitors is their name, and then moving through the various other treatments available to them. So we look after men um, and teach them how to give different medications for their erection problems, and then if they end up with end-stage erectile dysfunction where they don't respond to tablets, then at that point they may need to consider a penile prosthesis, and this is where either Fiona or myself will be able to see them, we'll go through the implants with them in detail, and we also get to see them after the operation too. Because we're a tertiary referral centre, we see men of uh, all ages. However, I'd say that the majority of men that we're seeing at the moment uh, is the, the gentlemen that have undergone radical prostate surgery. We spend time talking to them about um, what treatment would be best suited for them if they've had non-nerve sparing surgery. We uh, would try a PD-5 inhibitor, although this is unlikely to work, and then we would move on to the injectables or the um, transurethral alprostadil pellets. We would also uh, discuss with them trying a vacuum device in order to stretch up and maintain the penile uh, length, um, and we would refer for psychosexual counselling if we thought that that was uh, going to be beneficial for them. Um, so, obviously, Every patient you have to treat individually. So when we see everyone, um, we're obviously taking a full history from them first. And then we're explaining to them what, well, first of all, letting them know everything that is available. And then almost sort of trying to, trying to titrate it to them um, to make sure that they have the most realistic expectations. Every person's different, so and we have to go at different paces depending on each each patient. So the important thing what we do each for each person that we meet is we take a history, and we also find out about their social history and their partner. Um, so what's important to them, and then we also obviously find out about their what they've tried in terms of their erections and what do they want to achieve. Some. Some men will not have a partner, but they'll say they just want to feel like a man again. Some feel that they've lost their masculinity by not getting erections. So it's working out what their goal is, but then also as a nurse, trying to be very clear in what they can achieve, because sometimes their expectations may be a little bit unrealistic. So for example, where they start on their treatment, what have they tried, making sure that sure they go through that step ladder treatment. So if they haven't tried tablets, they may need to try them, that they don't go straight to surgery, or that they don't know that you could try injections. So going through all the available options, and then equally, when you get to whatever step, making sure that they know exactly what that treatment entails and what to expect by it. So for an example, if, if I can give one, you know, when we say about an implant, an implant is designed to give them rigidity and hardness, but we'll say it's not designed for length. So whereas, say, men who have had erection problems for a while and they've lost their, some penile length, because that's quite common, especially with uh, chaps, well, pretty much any chap who's had erection problems will say, oh, my penile length is shorter than I remember it. So saying to them, well, yes, when you have an implant, you'll get rigidity, you'll be able to have sex, but your penile length will not be as long as before you had an erection problem. So that's our role, to make sure that patients fully understand all the options and, and then making sure that hopefully they're as happy as possible with their treatment. With the, P, with the PD-5 inhibitors, they're the least invasive option um, for men, obviously because it's a tablet that's being taken, so Viagra, Cialis, um, those types of drugs. 
However, um, some men will find them very, very um, uncomfortable. They don't like the headache that they get with the drug, although they may have a good response to it, um, which would mean that they then have to go on to try something a little more invasive. In terms of the more invasive drugs, it's essentially alprostadil, and we have it in a uh, little pellet form, Muse, or Vitaros, which is a cream that you insert into the urethra, or there's the injectable um, Cavaject, which is one of the trade names, into the side of the penis, directly into the erectile tissue. There are some men that can't bear the thought of putting anything down into their urethra and therefore they would prefer to try the injections, but then there are some men that are, just cannot bear the thought of injecting themselves. So the, uh, the Muse transurethral alprostadil um, pellet option would be preferable. If Can I just add to that? Mm. I was going to say, I think, again, the role for us is to make sure that all the patients are aware of the available options. Mm -hmm. So they may discount it. They may not go for every single treatment. Um, and as long as they've got a valid reason of why that might not be an appropriate treatment, that's, that's fine. But, but they should be aware of everything um, mm. before, before they obviously... Yeah. Um, finish and and I think that there you know we we meet men who say absolutely there's no mm -hmm. way I will inject myself but then when they look at the needle when they hear that most men don't actually feel the needle go in when they self inject well then they're willing to give it a mm -hmm. go and what we do in clinic is we allow them that time to to get used mm -hmm. to the thought of injecting themselves and we go through the process with them when we meet patients and they haven't tried any of the uh, medications, they're starting out on the pathway for their erections, for their erectile dysfunction, um, we will discuss the first line, second line and third and, and final stage, which would be penile prosthesis, but we only touch on that. Uh, we concentrate on where they're at at the moment, so we would concentrate on the PD5 inhibitors before. We mention penile um, implants when we first see patients um, but first of all, we're going to go through all of the, the um, stages for their erectile dysfunction. We start with the first line drugs, which would be a PD-5 inhibitor. Uh, if that didn't work, we also then discuss the second line um, drugs. And we will then uh, just mention a penile implant, but it's not the focus when we first meet mm -hmm. gentlemen. Um, in terms of a taboo, I think because of where we work, we're very used to the penile prostheses and, and therefore we, we think it's the norm really to talk about it. Um, but I can appreciate that when men come to clinic, they've never heard of this fancy hydraulic device and can't imagine having something like that inserted. Every person who decides to have a penile implant needs to be seen by a nurse where we work. And what we do is that we go through uh, with the patient, we show them the implants, and we spend a long time with them talking about what to expect after surgery. So we get them to look at the implants, feel, feel the material, although it's all inside their body, um, we think it's important for them to know exactly where the different components are placed. And then we'll go through about the risks of surgery, um, and also what to expect pre and post op. I think, it, I mean, it is difficult, but um, as Claire said, we do um, show them the implants and, and we always say that nothing is as soft as their own mm -hmm. erectile tissue. So therefore, when a, the, the cylinders are in situ, even when the implant is deflated, they will feel a kind of a crunchiness um, mm -hmm. under finger and thumb when they um, squeeze their penis when the implant is deflated. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, there are other factors, for example, when the implant um, is in place, normally if a man is cold, he, the, the penis will retract slightly, but the penis will stay at a fixed length all the time because the cylinders will act as a stent really and hold it in position. Um, and, and also when the implant is deflated, I, we stress to them that mm. they can possibly feel the corners of those cylinders mm. when they're folded. I think that's important actually, because you do get some chaps who do come back to clinic and they say, oh, I can, I can feel these edges, is something wrong with the implant? Yeah. And it's not. Mm -hmm. So we, we make sure that we tell them that while, they, while they're having a feel of it before. Yeah. So it gives yeah. them a bit more reassurance. Indeed, and in addition, we, we say that with the pump within the scrotum, mm -hmm. it's like having a third testicle. And it feels quite heavy when it's first implanted mm -hmm. and it takes a bit of getting used to. Mm -hmm. So we will go through this with them on counselling. So most patients, if providing they're not, say, diabetic on insulin, will come in on the day of surgery, and like with an anaesthetic, would be staffed from midnight. Um, they obviously would have the operation, hopefully under a general anaesthetic, if they're allowed to from a pre-assessment point of view. Occasionally, it might be done under something called a spinal. Um, when they wake up from the operation, 
the man can expect to have a urethral catheter, which is a drainage tube coming out their penis, which drains their urine. The implant is kept inflated and there's a bandage around the penis and around the scrotum. And then they'll also often have a little drain in, draining some blood. And then they can eat and drink as normal when they wake up and they'll be given painkillers to help them with their pain, but although they'll also have probably been given a bit of local anaesthetic during the, during the operation. So they'll eat and drink as normal. And then the next morning we come round, we take their dressing down and then we deflate their implant which has been left inflated. That can normally be a little bit sore and we'll tell the patients that when we see them, so to expect that. So we tell them that will be uncomfortable for a few seconds and then the prosthesis be deflated as much as possible. The catheter would then be removed, followed by the drain. And then once they're passing urine, so going to the toilet, we'd let them go home. Usually they'd have a little pad to support their scrotum and we'll tell them that they'll get some swelling and some bruising and that will usually come out after a couple of days and they'll feel very sore. So we do tell the men that this is a sore operation but the soreness does not last forever. Eventually you would uh, say you'd be sitting in front of me as you are today. You'd be comfortable but the first few weeks are sore. It takes a little while to get over it. You may not be able to work for a few weeks and you may feel quite miserable. And I have had some chaps, in, in honesty, who have said to me, oh, you know, why, why did I have this done? But then I say, say to them, you'll be, you know, you're saying this now because you're sore, but trust me, you'll be okay in a few weeks. And they will, they'll come back after that and say, you're absolutely right, I'm really pleased I had this done. We normally see um, patients back uh, three weeks following the operation. Um, we do give them our contact details, so if they have any problems between uh, their outpatient appointment and their, their discharge and their outpatient appointment, well, then we will see them earlier if necessary. Um, but when we do see them, we check their wounds. Uh, they normally just have a scrotal wound, but if they've had abdominal surgery previously, it may be that the surgeon will make a separate incision to uh, visualise and directly put the, um, the reservoir uh, into the lower abdomen. Um, so we'll check the, the wounds and we will um, inflate and deflate the implant if we can at that point at three weeks post-surgery. Um, sometimes there can be formation of a haematoma which is a jellyfied collection of blood surrounding the, the pump which makes it difficult to appreciate the anatomy of the pump when we see them. So if, if that's the case and we can't comfortably feel the deflate mechanism we won't try and inflate the device. We'll let everything settle down for another two weeks or so and get them back to clinic at which point we'll then have another go at uh, cycling the implant. Generally we try and tell people wait till you come back to clinic for us to teach you. And I've had some chaps who come back and they straight away can inflate and deflate it. Whereas some men it takes a bit longer. It, I remember when I first started in the job, I took a little while to get used to it. Um, but it's like anything. So it's just time and we'll give men the time they need, but they do get it in the end. We let them know that the, the, the pro of, of having the surgery is the fact that they'll be able to achieve and maintain erection that will be firm enough for penetration. We do uh, make sure they're aware of the fact that, as Claire previously mentioned, the implant is not designed to restore any length that's been lost through prolonged erectile dysfunction. So as long as men are aware of that, um, satisfaction rates are high. If they've had problems with um, engorgement of the glands before they've had their surgery, they're not going to have any improvement to that post-surgery. So um, we would suggest something like the Muse or maybe Vitaros in, to help engorge the glands if that's a problem to them post-op. No, we'll, we'll, we, we usually follow up them up for about a year, but essentially we'll only see people in clinic until they're confident that they're inflating and deflating the device themselves. Then we like to form a telephone follow-up because we want to make sure they're happy um, and they've got no concerns. And then once, once they're established, and, and then we'll discharge them back to their GP. Of course, uh, we tell them before that the implant, depending on their age, may not last them forever. They do have an average lifespan. So if it did ever stop working in the future, then they could get their GP to refer back to us. When we see patients in clinic, um, we, uh, we have certain criteria that the patient has to meet in order to proceed with surgery. For the diabetics, they need to have their diabetes well controlled and where we work, 
uh, the, their HbA1c, their long-term control needs to be 75 uh, millimoles per mole or less. Um, also, for an inflatable type of implant, uh, the patient has to have a waist circumference of less than 100 centimetres and we aim for their BMI to be below 30. We have the two measurements now because there are some men who have got no um, fat on them at all, for example, a, a rugby player who's going to have a high BMI but they don't have any abdominal fat. So that's why the waist circumference is important. Um, and the man has to be fit enough for a general anaesthetic as well in order to pr proceed with surgery. And every patient will go to a preoperative assessment to make sure that they're fit. So there are some men that are going to be suitable for just a malleable device, particularly if they're on their own and they have no one to help them if they have poor manual dexterity. Um, we do have patients who do have an inflatable implant and if they've got a partner who's willing to uh, inflate the device for them, well then uh, they could proceed to having that surgery. I'd say most men are, are very satisfied as long as they have realistic expectations. And for partners too, um, I, we usually quote around about 90% or above for male and females. Um, so if men do have a partner, it's nice to involve them in the process and bring them to the appointments so they know what to expect too. And right. some men, yeah, and some men we find do have a disconnect. It's, it, I'd say the majority of men actually get on very quickly and very well with the implant once, it, once it's, it's there. Um, but um, I've had a few chaps who, six months down the line, are saying, there's a real disconnect here, but with time, it, it does feel like part of them. I think probably the main disappointment with men may be related to penile length. You know, some of these men may not have had erection for a long time and they will have lost penile length. So it can be a little bit of a disappointment for some, some men. Hopefully, our role is to try and give them the expectation before they have the operation. We do a stretch penile length test, so we will try and demonstrate to them in the clinic before what to expect afterwards. But obviously, until they have actually had the operation, they can't see for themselves. So for some men, that can be a bit disappointing, but we always try and say to them, start to use the advice, in terms of how it feels, there are um, many men who, I'd say the majority of men, um, find it, they take to it like a duck to water. Um, they're very used to their implant very, very quickly and find that it does feel very natural. But there are some men who find there's a bit of a disconnect um, and it takes them a while to get used to this new device that's been implanted. Um, in terms of sensitivity, there are men that will experience a, a sort of a patchy numbness to the shaft of the penis and also to the, the glands, but that's usually in the short term and that should improve with time. Yeah, I mean overall we say to patients, don't we, that implants are designed for rigidity maintenance, but they shouldn't affect your sensation, orgasm, ejaculation. So if you ejaculated before, mm -hmm. you should ejaculate afterwards. The first thing we do is we show them the different devices we get them to have a feel of them and we talk them through where the different components go in their body. After that we go through the risks of the procedure and what to expect. So essentially we tell them that having an implant is an end stage option so once you have an implant put in you can't change your mind and go back. We tell them that it shouldn't affect sensation, orgasm, ejaculation and we tell them that implants are there to design to provide rigidity and maintenance of erection. As mentioned, we go through the risks of the procedure and then we also talk about what to expect before the procedure, during the procedure and their aftercare and about coming back to see us in clinic to be taught how to use the devices. For anyone that's going to or thinking about going ahead with surgery, they need to be absolutely sure that it's the right decision for them. Um, some gentlemen are keen to talk to others who've already had the mm. surgery and we have gentlemen that are very willing to talk to others about their experience uh, and that can be incredibly helpful. Well I'd, I'd probably tell them to do a little bit of research, um, see if they can you know do some reading, perhaps talk to someone who's been through it before if they get that opportunity and we can arrange that. Um, it's about what's important to them you know how important is this if this is their only option and sex is important to them then 
they should go for it. If they're struggling, we ask them to come back and see us so that we can go through it again and we don't, um, uh, and we don't stop until they've mastered their technique. Um, we have a little key ring example of the um, pumps that we can give patients to take home with them to act as a visual aid and they can use these um, whilst they're feeling for the anatomy of the pump within the scrotum. Mm. We, we, we get them to, we say a good place to practice in the bath or mm -hmm. shower because everything feels a bit softer and a bit thinner so it's a good chance to have a, a good feel of the inflate and deflate mechanism. And we won't, we'll only ask them to deflate if we're fully confident that they know how to inflate and deflate it. So otherwise we'll see them back in clinic.